Jesus told his disciples of things to come. He would be persecuted, beaten and mocked. The Son of God would die on a cross. But he wouldn't stay dead, and he won't stay gone. He wouldn't stay dead, and he won't stay gone. Jesus is coming to take us home. His blood has bought me, and His Word has taught me. He wouldn't stay dead, and He won't stay gone. In the Bible we're told, He surely will come. Like a thief in the night, with the trump of God. The King of Kings will take us home. He wouldn't stay dead, and he won't stay gone. He wouldn't stay dead, and he won't stay gone. Jesus is coming to take us home. His blood has bought me, and his word has taught me. He wouldn't stay dead, and he won't stay gone. Amen. Amen. Thankful for that promise. He said, if I go away to prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And we know that he went away, and that means that he's going to come back because we can trust in his word. Tonight, uh, we're going to go to uh, the book of Luke this evening. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn there, Luke chapter 24. Um, I know that we've been preaching through Daniel on Sunday evenings, um, but just felt uh, with uh, this being Easter still, we wanted to focus still on the resurrection. And uh, so that we're going to do that this evening uh, with the evening events that took place. A little bit more about those, and uh, so we're worth looking at that. We will continue the Daniel series on Wednesday night this week and uh, do Daniel chapter 7. So if you want to keep on reading that to keep your mind fresh, we'll go into that on Wednesday evening at our live stream at 7 p.m. So again, Luke chapter 24 this evening. And we are going to go to verse 13. This is the account of two disciples uh, walking on the road to Emmaus from Jerusalem. And Jesus appears to them. Luke 24 verse 13 says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? 
And right now we'll stop our reading at that point and ask for God's blessing on the preaching of His Word. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank You and we praise You. God, You're so good to us. And Lord, as we look once again this day uh, into Your Word, uh, to glean from it truth about Your resurrection, Lord, we, we want to give You praise. We pray that You would help us to be grounded and firm in Your faith. In the name of Your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. And so again, we are uh, rejoicing at the resurrection of the Lord's Savior. Now, one of the benefits that we have is that we are looking at all of these events after they have already passed. Um, to be in the middle of these events, uh, the, the, the resurrection uh, circumstances um, would be in a, quite a different story, a whirlwind um, events if, they, if we were actually going through them with the disciples. And so uh, you still have to keep in mind that uh, they had seen the um, uh, atrocities that was committed against Christ and, and they knew that he was dead. They knew where he was buried. They knew all these things that had taken place. And so um, a lot of interesting uh, things were going through the people's minds that had followed Jesus. Um, we're told in one passage of scripture that... Uh, this was like idle tales to them. If you read uh, just a couple of verses back in this same chapter, verse 11, when Mary um, uh, and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, came in, it says in verse 11, they told the disciples what was, what was done, what had been told to them about the empty grave. And it says, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. And Peter and John ran and checked out the tomb themselves to find that it was indeed empty. But yet they had still not seen the Lord at this time. And in fact, it wasn't until after the events that we're going to read about tonight that Jesus appeared to them in the room. So these were all uh, sort of afternoon and evening events that had taken place. Now, Peter had received a vision, uh, or not a vision, but had received a visit from Jesus Christ himself. And so by the point that these two individuals meet with Jesus, we had the women who gathered at the tomb. And then we had Peter also meeting with Jesus. Um, apparently we'll read about that. And then it'll be these two individuals. And then it'll be what we preached this morning about the individuals, um, all the disciples except for Thomas uh, in the upper room. And so these two individuals, they've heard what the women have said, and they've heard what has happened with Peter and John. And, and, and so they know that the body of Jesus is missing, and they, they know all the events that's happened this Passover week, and they're now heading to a village called Emmaus, we're told in verse 13. One of the disciples we know is named Cleopas. We learn of that in the 18th verse. And uh, we don't have anything else about him in Scripture or outside of Scripture. And the other disciple that was alongside of with him, we also don't know who he was or what was in there. So we know that this was not a part of the original 12 um, these two disciples may have been part of the 70 disciples or followers of Jesus. But what it demonstrates is to, to us is that Jesus had a larger following than just the 12 and these few women. Jesus had a lot of people. And as we said last Sunday at Palm Sunday, um, a lot of people look at the crowd at that was at Jerusalem and think of how feeble they are um, uh, in, in praising him on one day and then less than a week later they're crying for him to be crucified. Um, it was really that there were two separate groups of people. As Jesus had a following and these two disciples, um, not the original disciples, they were one, part of that following that was praising Jesus and worshiping Jesus. And so you can imagine even that, that they, are, they are just a little bit farther removed from the teachings. They didn't have that uh, three and a half year journey uh, side by side with Jesus like the 12 disciples. And so you can imagine what is even going through in their head. And so they follow Jesus. They've listened to him as best as they can. But yet they don't, like the other disciples, understand everything. 
And so they are on their way home. Uh, I, we guess that they're probably from Emmaus and that they're heading home or maybe it's a, a, a stopover, a layover, or maybe they're starting to travel through the cities to tell other followers of Jesus that weren't at Passover, that didn't make the trip, um, that Jesus was now dead and that his body had been stolen. We don't really know why they were on the way to Emmaus, but they were going to stop there for the evening, we find, for a meal and to uh, at least stay the night. And so they're there and they're walking and they're talking about these things that had happened. Now, now they had quite a bit of time walking. Uh, Emmaus was about eight miles, almost eight miles, about seven and a half to eight miles northwest of Jerusalem. And so they're walking on this road and it says that they talked together of all those things which had happened. Um, and it came to pass that they were communing together and reasoning. So they were laying down the evidence, all the teachings of Jesus, all the things that had transpired these past few days. And, and they're trying to put all these pieces together. And they're confused. And they are, they are torn up over all the things that happened. They probably had, like other disciples, try to uh, leave home and, and give up jobs in order to follow Jesus. And now all of that has been pulled out from underneath of them. And that's really how we get sometimes in life, is that when we begin to follow Jesus, um, we begin to think, man, this is great, and we're hoorah for Jesus and boo on the devil, and we're, we're, we're following him, and and we think that, that everything is going well and our life seems to be coming together in all these nice, neat packages. And, and it's really, really good. And then all of a sudden, the rug is pulled out from under us. And for these disciples, it was that Jesus died and they believed still that his body had been stolen out of the tomb. And so they're, 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 they're trying to put pieces together. What is the next steps for us to take? What, what are we going to do that we have now lost um, Jesus? And so they're doing this together. And then all of a sudden, an individual comes to them. Now, we are told in verse 15 that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Jesus walked with these disciples, these two that was on their way to Emmaus, and, and they didn't realize who he was. It says in verse 16, their eyes were holding that they should not know him. We're not exactly sure what that uh, means, whether uh, maybe, maybe it was from Jesus, just like Mary didn't recognize Jesus until he spoke. Uh, maybe there was something about his resurrected body that had a little bit different. I mean, he didn't look like he did when he was on the cross. Uh, the only telltale signs was that he still had the nail pierced hands and feet and, and the uh, side where he was pierced. So they, that's all they had. Um, but uh, it could have been that there was some type of, uh, uh, of spiritual uh, holding back of the image that they could not recognize Jesus, and it wouldn't be unveiled till the right, right time. Um, it's an interesting thing, and I'll bring it up later again, is that as they were walking with Jesus, maybe he kept his hands covered. Maybe there was something about him, uh, his image, uh, that was cleaned up, that was glorified in this this risen body that he had, that they didn't recognize him per se by face. Um, but later on, it says that when they, uh, he was breaking bread with them, they were able to recognize him after he had blessed the bread and began to serve it to him. Maybe it was at that time that he handed them the bread that he had just blessed and break that he did this, that they seen the nail prints in his hands. That, 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 that could be a telltale sign that uh, this was Jesus or and then whatever. Um, but we go through here. They didn't recognize him. This individual that they had followed, they did not recognize Jesus. And he comes to them and he begins to talk with them. And he says, what are you talking about that has you so down? Why are you sad? He ends in verse 17. Why are you talking, walking, and sad at the same time? 
you can almost get the sense that Jesus is uh, kind of uh, playing dumb to get them to talk to him, to introduce himself into that. Um, he's coming in this uh, very meek way. And that's how the Lord works with us when he comes into our life, when he begins to work in our situation. A lot of times he doesn't come in a great flash. A lot of times when Jesus joins us in our journey, he does so in, in, in these more meek and mild ways. Uh, well, a lot of times we're always looking for the big flash of conviction or the big miracle. But here we have an instance where Jesus was not, uh, was not immediately convincing of his presence. Or uh, there was no visual, visually spectacular thing that appeared. There was no flashes of light. There was no, um, no, no miracles that had been displayed among them when he, Jesus showed up. He just starts walking with them on the road. He may have came from the side or he may have came slowly up here from the back that they didn't notice. Or he may have been walking the opposite direction. But whatever it is, there is nothing about his appearance that uh, uh, surprises these individuals or takes them off guard that there is something unique about the individual that they're now talking to. And that's how Jesus works into our life. He becomes, uh, begins to make inlets into our life uh, that we don't really understand. And we don't know how he's working things out. He's going somewhere with them. He is on this journey to encourage their faith, to challenge it, and, and, and to bring them back into a, a trusting relationship with God's plan of salvation. But to do that, he is working with them and he is going to walk. And that's the blessed miracle about what Jesus does in our life every day is that he walks with us for the long thing, uh, for the long run. He, 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 he takes these steps with us. He doesn't just show up as we preach this morning as a deistic God that shows up just when we need him and, and, and does a miracle and then he goes. He's not this fairy uh, or, or, or this, this fairy godmother that shows up just in the nick of time. He is the God that is walking with us in the valley of our sadness. He is the God who is with us throughout these steps. And he is there uh, in the good times. He is there in the bad times. He is there and he gives off this. He gives us this peaceful presence and helps walk us through the things that are going on in our life. You say, why would God reveal himself over time like that? Why didn't Jesus just come up and say to Mary or to these individuals like he did the disciples later that evening? Here I am. Look at me. Why did he look at those first two individuals and allow them to think that he was somebody else for the time being? Well, you see, God is always revealing himself to us in his time. He is working these things in his own way. His understanding is above our understanding and his ways are above our understanding. You still say, why? Well, the best answer I can give you is from Romans chapter 8. It says that he works all things out to the good of them that love him, that love his appearing. And so everything that he does, um, these slow unveilings of who he is and, and his displays of power and, and bringing us into him is for our good. He knows that a lot of times that things we we can do a lot of things prematurely on our own and we can get ahead of ourselves. And so he takes us through a longer journey a lot of times to bring us out to the best results. He knows how to grow us. He knows how to lead us. And, uh, and with God, sometimes the shortest route to get to the destination is not the best route, is not what he wants us to go through because we don't go through the growth that comes from the journey, from a long journey with him. He takes us through the hard areas of life. He takes us through the valley of the shadow of death. He takes us through these parts of life to work things out in our life to bring us closer to him in this manner. So he walks with them. He doesn't unveil himself immediately. He just walks and he begins to talk with them. Let's read on in verse 18. Uh, to verse 24, it says, and, he said, or, and one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known these things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? 
And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and how rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. And so here they are talking about how uh, there, was, there was some issues there about, um, that went on in Jerusalem about Jesus, about this Jesus of Nazareth. You see that they still don't recognize him. Uh, uh, and they talk about Jesus, who he was. He was a prophet. He was mighty indeed and word before God and to all the people. And the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to death and crucified him. Um, they put this individual to death. And it was a major thing. Jesus was this well-known prophet from the land of Galilee. And, and they put him to death. And it was a major public mockery and public display before all the people. And then he says, We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. And so he talks about how, how this, is, this was somebody that we put our complete trust in. We believe that he would redeem Israel. We believe that he would set us free from, from what uh, the Romans have put us under. We thought he would set up his earthly kingdom and, and that he would, he would rule and, and, and that all things would be made right for Israel. And, and beside all this... It's been three days since he died. And so not only is he dead, but this is the aftershock of it. He has been dead three days. Now I think uh, just a real quick point. This is a major, major area where we see the timing. There's a lot of people that debate uh, when the crucifixion was. There's people that argue it was Wednesday, Thursday, and even Good Friday. But if we take this, what he says here, um, literally, and they'll point to other scriptures, um, about three whole days and three whole nights and stuff. But here's another scripture that says, this is the third day these things are done. This is the evening that Jesus appeared, three days since he was crucified. Um, so that's, that's, that's Sunday, the first day of the week. Then you have Saturday, which would have been the Sabbath. That would have been the second day. And then you would have Friday. That would be the uh, first day of it. So, so you have the three days counting back in that instance with Sabbath being the third day since the crucifixion had been done. And so they're talking about this. They're saying our situation is really grim. He's been put to death and now three days later. It's three days since this has happened. And I know that when we have uh, ministered to people who have lost loved ones, really, when, they, when that person passes away, um, even in the day of the funeral, it is a quite, quite a bit of a, a shock to the system that people feel numb and, and they really don't know a lot of what's going on um, not a lot of things are remembered because uh, it's just passing by. They're, they're so, so numb to what has happened. And it's not really until a week later or a few days after when you uh, begin to really notice and come out of that numbness that that person's presence is missing. And that, I think that's kind of what they're talking about here. He says he's, he's died. Uh, we witnessed all the horrific actions taken against him. And, and we've seen uh, him buried. And now it's three days and this is really settling in. We're just heading home to go talk it over. But it gets even worse as he goes on. He says in verse 22... Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. Talking about that morning. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but they saw him not. 
And so that happened all in the morning. And as I read there in the previous part of the chapter, uh, when the women came and told him, it sounded like idle tales. It sounded like, like, like false words, like, uh, uh, like it was, they was this kind of joking or that they were out of their mind. And so Peter and John went and checked it themselves and they didn't see anything. The tomb was empty. And they didn't see any angels. They didn't see Jesus at that time. And they had came back and told the rest of the disciples and, and said, <coughs> It's true, his body's gone, but we didn't see any angels. And so now these two individuals are gone. They're, they're, they're defeated because Jesus is dead. He's been dead for three days and he is missing. His body is gone. As we talked this morning, when Peter and John left, the graveside, they, they, didn't, they didn't believe because they did not know the scriptures that Jesus would resurrect from the dead. These two disciples also did not know that. They did not understand. And so they, so they, they struggled with that. They are in despair. Have you ever been in despair? Bad news after bad news, heartbreak comes after heartbreak. And you just can't seem to catch, a, catch any hope. You can't seem to get up out of where you're at. That's what these two are laying down for us and for Jesus right here. They're just pouring it all out. Jesus is dead. He's been dead for three days now. And his body is missing. We have no hope. He was our hope. We placed everything in Him. And now we don't see Him. And that's where we can get to in our life. Where we lose all hope. And because God isn't moving in our way and according to our understanding, our faith is shaken. We're rattled. And so Jesus begins to talk to them. He says in verse 25, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so here's, here's, here's the thing. Jesus begins to look at these individuals and he has one thing uh, of condemnation to them. Here's one thing that he, that he chides them for. This is the first area after the resurrection where we see him uh, challenge somebody's viewpoint or challenge where somebody is by words of confrontation. He looks at them and says, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He calls them fools and links that with unbelief. And so what happens a lot of times when despair creeps in, we know the word of God. We could probably recite some scripture. But the reality is that at that time, we don't believe what we have read. Or what else happens is that we read something and because it does not seem pleasant, then we begin to go the opposite direction. And so a lot of times we begin to hold on to that stuff that we agree with and we disagree with that stuff that we don't like. We call this uh, uh, confirmation bias in research. Um, when you, you and I see it all the time. Um, our friends that lean to one party, um, one particular worldview, um, they will always bring up articles and share things on social media or in conversations that support their view. And people from another viewpoint will always share the stuff that's from their viewpoint. And they won't read anything from somebody else's viewpoint. That's called confirmation bias. And the reality is we do that in a lot of areas of our life. When we studied it, um, it was in research. And we talked about how this comes even into 
scientific research. You can't get away from it and that there is nobody who sees anything from nowhere. There is no true objectivity when it comes to things like research. And here, when we begin to apply that to our spiritual life, a lot of times we will read parts of the Word of God and we uh, don't like it. And so we try to research other ways to explain it. I heard it said one time, the Bible is not hard to understand. A lot of times the plainest reading is the correct reading. But the problem is that it is hard to obey and people will make easy things difficult because they don't want to obey it. And so that's what we begin to maybe see here is that these two individuals, they've already said, we know the scriptures and we know these events and we're trying to put them together. But remember, their bias was found in verse 21. They trusted Jesus because they believed that he would be the one to redeem Israel. They believed like everybody else around them. They didn't understand the scriptures fully and they believed because of their bias about Israel, their bias about what they thought God was doing and God was moving in a different direction. And so they were, they were, they were against that. And so, so Jesus looks at them and says, says you're foolish and you're slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. And so they begin to, uh, Jesus began to teach about the prophets. Now the prophets, he says, he starts at Moses and goes through all the prophets, so the law and the prophets, and he teaches them. And this sounds a lot like what Peter was telling uh, us to do and to, uh, uh, telling us how our salvation can be explained and seen through Scripture. Of what God was doing. First Peter chapter 1 verses 8 through 12. Uh, I'm sorry verse 10 through 12 says this. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us. They did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. And so the prophets, when God was giving them the word uh, for the Old Testament, and they were searching the meaning of all these visions, these dreams, and all the words that he had given to them, they looked at the sufferings of Jesus Christ, of the Messiah, and they didn't understand it. That was what they didn't, didn't had a hard time swallowing. Even the prophets and, the, and these people in the Old Testament, and, and these two right here, these two disciples and all of Israel, and, and, and even modern day Israel is looking at the Old Testament and looks at the uh, Messiah and all the kingdom that he's going to set up and all the good things that he's going to do. And that's what they focus on. But they get hung up. Uh, we see that they're hung up on the sufferings of Christ. They don't understand the sufferings that the Messiah would go through. They want all the glory of the Messiah, but they do not want to accept the prophecies of the Messiah's suffering. And so when the Messiah suffered, such as what we're told in Isaiah chapter 53, the scripture that talks about the suffering servant and explains so much of what is happening here, or that Psalm 22 was a messianic psalm portraying Jesus Christ. They look at that and say, that can't be the Messiah because the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to do all these things and lift us up on high thrones and make us rulers and, and set up a kingdom that sets us up above everybody else. And he's going to bring this unparalleled peace throughout uh, the remainder of history. And so, so that was what was in their mind. And because that was what was in their mind, they rejected everything else. We do that with scripture today. And when that happens, we uh, just bring our despair and our discouragement even farther down the road because we do not accept the reading of Scripture. We do not accept the trajectory from cover to cover. That's why Jesus was taking this journey with them. You realize that? He couldn't have taught Moses to the prophets in just a 500-foot journey. The idea wasn't that they needed a miracle. 
They didn't need some gigantic spiritual explosion in front of them. They needed to be taught the scripture through a lens of Jesus Christ and what he was truly doing from the beginning. And so Jesus went back to Moses to the prophets and he took this eight mile journey to go through all of that. And as he did, it says he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He pointed out the things that were fulfilled in him, the typologies that were shown in him. He explained to them the direct prophecies about him and who he was, that he was doing more than just coming to set up an earthly kingdom, that the Messiah was more than just bringing glory to the nation of Israel. The Messiah was coming to suffer and take our place for our sins. That is why Jesus Christ came. He said himself, I came not to serve. Or I came not to be served, but I came to serve. I came to ransom. I came to lay down my life for the sheep. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come to puff himself up. He didn't come for any other reason but to save us from our sins. And that is what Jesus was explaining to them. And that's what you and I have to accept tonight is that Jesus went through suffering for our sins and that it nailed him to the cross and that he died for willingly that you and I can be set free. And if that approach to scriptures that we accept the good and the bad, then you and I, we, we need to accept that and come under that trust. That there are difficult things in Scripture that it asks us to do. But it's Scripture nonetheless. Old Testament and New Testament is all Scripture that is given by God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. You can't accept just portions of the Bible and throw out what you disagree with. You have to come underneath the umbrella of it all. Not standing on uh, above Scripture, but sitting below Scripture. It has to have the final authority in your life. You have to trust in it like you trust in anything else. You have to give complete surrender to what Scripture is saying to us. These disciples, they were slow to believe. Are you slow to believe? Countless evidence has been put in front of you. You've listened to sermon after sermon after sermon. And you say like one of the rulers to King Agrippa to uh, Paul when he said, I'm almost persuaded. And Paul said, I, I wish more were almost persuaded, but not just almost persuaded, but fully persuaded. I wish that it wasn't just halfway. I wish it was all the way. That's the challenge. Will you believe? Now look what happens. Verse 28, reading to verse 35, says, And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. Jesus acted like he was going on. But it, they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, he blessed it, and brake, and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. My, what a miracle. Jesus was there. He blessed them. And that's, that's, that's the thing. I can, I can almost see that part of the unveiling of who he was. I believe there was a spiritual fog that that was put over their eyes to uh, lead them to this moment when, when the big miracle would happen, when the full realization of who he was took place. But I believe also part of it was when he took that bread and handed it to them, there was no doubt that they seen the nail pierced hands and that would have stuck out like any other thing. And so they, they wanted Jesus to talk with him. There was something about this individual, what he was saying that they longed for. We long for Jesus and his truth. And he blessed them. Their eyes were opened and he vanished out of sight. 
he was he was gone. There there was there was the big miracle point, the big demonstration that many of us long for. It came after they begged Jesus to stay around. They wanted more of him. They knew it was Jesus. And it says in verse 32, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while He talked with us by the way and while He opened to us the Scriptures? We need some spiritual heartburn. We need to listen to Jesus. We need to sit under the Word of God and allow it to pour into our soul. As we read into it, yes, we can read commentaries, we can, we can look at dictionaries, we can look at newspapers and try to associate things with Scripture to the times of today. But the reality is that the teacher needs to be Jesus Christ, ministering to our hearts and minds through the Spirit. He opened up the Scriptures. Jesus will open up the Scriptures to us when we want to listen to Him. When we're listening to the world, when we're listening to false teachers, we won't hear the voice of Christ. But when we listen to the voice of Christ, when we have, when we have focused on Him and we have learnt His voice, He will open up the Scriptures to us. Verse 33, And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven were gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed. And half appeared to Simon. Now this is where we see that uh, these two disciples came back to confirm what the women had said earlier that morning. Uh, and, but when they got there, they found out not only had they seen them, but Peter had also seen them. Simon Peter. And so, so, so now you have the women, you have, you have Simon Peter, you have, you have Cleophas and this other disciple who have all seen the risen Lord. And then all of a sudden, when they tell them that we have seen Him, it says, and they told what things were done in the way and, know he was, and how He was known of them in breaking of bread. It says in verse 36, And as they spake, Jesus Himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Jesus showed up, like we said this morning, that's where this morning's sermon would step in with the Scripture where it brings into harmony among the four gospel writers. And He gave them peace. These disciples, they were in despair because their hearts were slow to believe what was in the Scripture. And Jesus had to go into that spirit, that, that, that closet, that, that scripture closet of their heart and give it a cleaning out. A lot of us have a dysfunctional closet in our, when it comes to scripture. We know all the stories. We, we know a lot of this stuff, but we also have a lot of um, old wives tales and we have a lot of um, uh, fancy sayings. A lot of us, our, 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 our scripture repertoire is based on uh, motto, mottos and, and cliches, things that are not based on Scripture, things that are not found in Scripture, and that fills our scriptural knowledge bank, our closet. And sometimes we need to go in there and clean it out and have it reorganized. We do that all the time here at my house, where it seems like we are constantly going through closets and throwing out old junk you know what I'm talking about, that entryway closet, that's a catch-all. and You know what's in there, but if you ever needed anything, it'd take you an hour to find it. That's how it is with Scripture. We know it's in there. We, we think it's in there. But then when we try to use it, it's such a mess. Here's a challenge. Don't be slow of believing in God's Word. Believe in it. And begin to search from cover to cover. How Christ was seen. We need to be about God's Word. We need to study His Word in order to live our lives acceptable before the Lord and to walk worthy of the calling that we have been called to walk with Jesus. And so tonight, when we read the Word of God and we begin to seek after Him in a deeper way, ask Him, Lord, will you make my heart burn inside of me? 
as I read your word, would you speak afresh to me these wonderful words of life? Would you, would you open my heart and my mind? Open my mind so that I can understand the plan of salvation that you worked out through history. Help me understand what you're saying clearly and plainly. And even more, take my heart and help me to believe what I have read. Help me to believe and trust and obey what you have said in your word. I pray that your week is blessed. Know that the Spirit of the Lord will go with you wherever you go when you walk in His light. He is always there. And here's your challenge. I know some of you have a little bit more time on your hands than normal. I pray that you use it wisely. Redeem the time. You've been given this time for a reason. Pray more. Read the Bible more. Fellowship with your family. Call people. Guess what? Call people. Text them. Um, you might spread computer viruses by email and by different things like that, but you won't pass the, the, the coronavirus by calling people and by emailing them and texting them and asking questions and studying the Bible through uh, Zoom conferencing or whatever it might be. You can do that. And you can, you can have, a, have a great time with that. And God, I believe, will bless you trying to go deeper in Him. You've got to have that spiritual heartburn. You've got to seek for it. You've got to allow the Spirit to move in your life by placing yourself in position that He can bless, that He will move on. He says, I need you to be here. I need you to pray. I need you to read my word. I need you to be faithful. So do it and see what He will do in your life. Have a blessed week. I'm praying for you, and I trust that you're praying for us. God bless you.